Good evening and uh, welcome to our study this evening. We're looking at narrative readings of the Old Testament. I'm going to wait just a second, see if anybody's able to log on. And, oh, my computer may have broken. And I'm hoping that you got the notes, which should be... I clicked, a, I put a link on Facebook just a few minutes ago. So, here's hoping, hey? Um, as always, if you have any thoughts or questions, post them and I'll respond uh, afterwards if I get a chance. So, as I said, we are we're looking at narrative readings of the Old Testament. And I wanted to start with uh, a reference, if you will, to uh, a book by Robert L. Alter. Now, he's a Jewish scholar. Uh, and his book, The Art of Biblical Narrative, really transformed the way people read scripture in the modern context. Uh, it's, it's amazing when people kind of bring these ideas and they, they, they popularize them. So this, his book came out in 1981 and it had a number of very important ideas in it. Uh, and I think in the modern context, Perhaps the idea that was sort of behind what he was talking about is the idea that deconstruction could be reconstruction. And that secondly, that the received text. So what, what you get when you open your Bible, if you've got a little Bible and you open it up and you look in the Old Testament and what you have there is literature and it can be read as literature in such a way as it might have... Uh, um, life in it. So it's useful to think about the fact that many of the insights into biblical criticism would have inf were at the time very confronting for most Christians. Because what was going on as biblical criticism in various forms, uh, archaeology, uh, all those sorts of things, was coming along it was undermining the received wisdom from the tradition, from, you know, from the church, essentially, of how to understand this stuff. So uh, what happened is that the text became less and less mysterious, less and less sacred, uh, as it started to be used as a tool to find out what was life like back then and, and things like that. And it was started to essentially have... God removed from it uh, as it was slowly pulled apart. Now, I'm not trying to for a second say that there weren't some very, very important ideas that were shared in that moment. There were. They were, they were incredibly important. Uh, but one of the, the side effects, the unintended consequences of that work, and I do say unintended because it was often taken by religious scholars, faithful people who wanted to know the scripture better. But when it was just dumped on the church without people kind of going through a whole set of processes, you lost something. So, uh, yeah, so from about 1500 onwards, the text became less and less meaningful, spiritual, uh, if that is a helpful way to, to think about it. So, what... Uh, Alter does is he takes the text, what we would call the Old Testament, uh, and he takes it and he turns it from a problem into a mystery. Now, often these two words sort of seem to operate the same, but it, uh, the best sort of way I've kind of thought about it, um, and this isn't my metaphor to start with, is a problem is a math thing, right? Like um, 5 plus 5 is 10, and the problem lives outside you. Uh, scientists, uh, what is that planet's atmosphere made out of? The problem lives outside them. Um, however, a mystery, the problem lives inside us. And you might think of relationships and, and you know, um, what might be going on in somebody's mind, particularly somebody that you care about. And so their inner life is a mystery to you because you're wrestling with it in an attempt to try and uh, learn from it and, and become wiser. So, Alter helps take the old, what we would call the Old Testament, 
and he creates mystery. We are able to wrestle with it in a way that brings life to us. And I actually put a picture of a fire pit there. And that's the fire that we used for the lighting of the fire at Easter night. And I've always loved that because for myself, those stories always just feel like, you know, let's just kind of, it's the story around the fireplace. It's the story around the kitchen table. Uh, and they, there's, a, there's an introduction into what it means to be connected to people through those stories. So, now, there were previous solutions to the problem of the demystifying, demystification of Scripture. Uh, one of them is uh, what's called Christian fundamentalism. Uh, and that was a movement, primarily in American Protestant, Protestantism, whew, uh, from the late 19th century, that was a pushback against theological modernity uh, and modern biblical techniques that was an attempt to kind of lock down meaning in Scripture. So, uh, and I was recently listening to a podcast and uh, Professor James Kugel was being interviewed. And he spoke about four really ancient uh, principles of biblical interpretation. And the really, one of them was this idea, which I think is fascinating, uh, is that biblical text is constructed is deliberately uh, and I've used the word not clear so the, the the surface level reading is very often not the intended biblical meaning and and you see this happening through people mm -hmm. before uh, before Christ during you know Jesus Paul mm -hmm. early uh, interpreters all struggling with these things it's fabulous uh, the other things that uh, were understood from um, those ancient times is that the text was relevant to every person, uh, was without error or contradiction, which I find fascinating. Because to say that it is deliberately uh, cryptic and without error or contradiction is a, is a difficult thing to hold together. Uh, and then the third or fourth is that it is of divine origin. However, what that means, as always, is up for debate, isn't it? You know, you can, you can attest to these things, but when you start to kind of scratch back the surface. surface. Anyway, so back to Alter. Alter says no. In the first instance, let's read the Old Testament as we would fiction. Now, fiction in this particular instance doesn't mean just made up stuff. It means... It's constructed in such a way that the narrative is the primary focus of what's going on rather than the historicity involved. So he might say fictionalized history or, 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 or um, those sorts of things. And he is moving away from the concept of uh, the necessary historicity of the Old Testament. He's saying the importance isn't in the did it really happen, but what is happening as we read this text? It's a very different approach. I think it's fabulous. So I hope you've kind of gotten on board with that. I hope. Uh, oh, I like skittles. Um, so uh, what are some of the, the, the steps? The first is and uh, is to just accept uh, that reading the Bible, the Old Testament, as n narrative and literature can itself be an authentic, faithful approach to the question. So as we read it that way, it can be life-giving. It can be what Scripture is supposed to be if we approach it as narrative. So rather than fighting about what really happened, we get to engage in the mystery of what does it mean very different approach so important okay so where was i up to the next thing is just broadly um just if it's been a while since you did english uh, at high school or university i mean I, I never did english at university um but if it if it's been a while what you can do 
narrative criticism just looks at the story and it says, uh, and it looks at the received story, the story that you have in front of you. Uh, if it looks at Moby Dick, it's looking at Moby Dick. If it looks at um, the story of the green sheep, it's looking at the story of the green sheep as you have it in front of you. And then it says, well, let's look at some of the characters, some of the setting. So Moby Dick is on the ocean. The story of the green sheep is, it's a kid's book. Uh, I think it's the story of the green sheep. Um, it's a kid's book and it's like it's got a little green sheep and it's looking for family and friends and things like that. It's lovely. Um, uh, we might look at plot, uh, literary devices, irony, sarcasm, the voice of the author, those sorts of things. All of those uh, are legitimate um, narrative devices, literary devices. You might even look at point of view. Is this written from a sort of a third person perspective? First person? Is it in memory? Is it all those sorts of things? Uh, and the implied reader. In theory, who's, who's, who's the reader of this? Uh, because that also is a part of the literary device. One of the things I, I came across here is when we look at the, um, the narrator of the Bible, it's fascinating because it sort of seems to flow backwards and forwards between a, um, an, a, an all-knowing narrator, perhaps the narrator in a sense is God, and a narrator that doesn't know what's happening, who doesn't have access to the details and the historicity. The narrator is the human voice. And so there's the idea that even if we just look at the narrator, we get this relational scriptures that are dynamic in in between us and God and, and that's an incredibly imp important thing to be able to draw out just from looking at the voice of the narrator so moving on moving on trying to uh, I feel like there's a lot of information here um, but anyway we'll keep going we'll keep trucking uh, so the next thing to do is to ask what are some specific tools that we can bring when we look at uh, biblical texts, when you look at the Old Testament as narrative. And um, so as story, uh, one of the things that Alter points to uh, is dialogue. Now, the Bible has a lot of dialogue and not a lot of uh, description going on in it. You know, it's more, it, it leans quite heavily almost into the, the Shakespearean play more than the, um, you know, the, the, the novel that has the sweeping descriptions of the environment and uh, does, it, ha, people are hardly ever really described. And even so, the, even when they are, it's in very sort of brief terms. You don't get loving looks into people's eyes as the wind blows gently in the background and the stars glimmer and you know uh, his eyes were like pools of darkness and uh, his robe even Joseph's robe we just kind of get like one word descriptor of it it's, it's a robe and it's, it's kind of odd somehow so it, it has a lot of dialogue it's got a lot of dialogue so the important thing to do is to pay attention to uh, the dialogue particularly Alta says, the first substantive piece of dialogue. So the, what's the first thing that is said? That will reveal the character of the person in a particularly significant way. And, and that's an important clue. So when we read something in Scripture, and we, we kind of see this, oh, here's the first time they get a voice. What they say is in all likelihood going to tell us a lot about them. That's important. That's important. Now, um, so that's a one tool. Just pay attention to the dialogue. Pay attention to where in the dialogue the story is. Pay attention to what it might reveal about motives, but also what it might not reveal. Uh, that very important stuff in there. So the next thing is to look at repetition and amendment. So often in scripture you get repetition. So uh, if you know if you read it, you get stories sort of repeating. 
uh, lines sort of repeating, uh, what are called type scenes repeating. I'll get to type scenes in a second. Um, you get all these sorts of things re repeating over and over. And that seems like a fairly mm, unhelpful way of telling a story, particularly a story as opposed to, say, a song or a poem. Um, but Alter says, no, 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 this is a really powerful technique. And he points out that often those stories, what they do is they then bring these two stories into a dynamic relationship so that we're not always going to see, so, so we're supposed to kind of understand them in light of each other. Uh, Rob Bell, who's one of the authors that I'm quite a fan of, uh, uses this uh, repetition to highlight something. Uh, and he says, you know, we get this phrasing, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. Um, and it's the same phrasing at the beginning of Exodus as it is at the beginning of Judges. Now, what that repetitious phrase does is it cues us that what we have here is... We, we're about to have a story of the Lord who is going to bring freedom to the people of Israel who are in a politically difficult place. Isn't that fascinating? So as soon as you see that cried out to the Lord, and in my English translation, Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, uh, which means it stands for the sacred name of God, the Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. Um, and so as soon as we see that, it should cue us to something's going on here. But where there's an, an amendment to the story, so if it's repeated but not repeated exactly, that too is important. Because um, we, that cried out, so earlier in Exodus we get uh, the Israelites cried out to Pharaoh. And it's funny because Pharaoh then, the, the people of Egypt, sorry, not the Israelites, the people of Egypt cried out to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh then refers them to Joseph. You see, we, we, we have the cried out, but it's not the Lord who answers, it's the Pharaoh. And it's, it's a very different kind of response. It's not an active response. So that repetition and amendment, both important, both important. The next thing, the next thing to have a quick look at is names. Now, lots of sermons, one of the first things you'll hear is, this is so-and-so's name, and this is what it means. This is what it translates to. Uh, and, you know, with kids, um, it, our, our son's name means God has heard or listens to God, depending on how you pronounce it, I, um, or God listens. So, you know, we have hope. We have hope. Um, but we, we often ask the meaning of names. But in the Bible, those names carry particular significance um, and the changing of a name is also very important Abram father of many becomes Abraham father of multitudes small difference small difference and yet it's a difference that invokes a promise to so much more Jacob becomes Israel after wrestling with God and so the destiny of Israel is tied to the notion of the wrestle with God and with, with others. It's the, the wrestling to find truth. Um, and so the names matter. So look them up. Look them up. It's worth the effort. The next thing <coughs> is uh, what's referred to as type scenes or motifs. Recurring, recurring images, recurring scenes, recurring settings. So, um, you know... Uh, Picture, uh, you know, it's a it's a old west saloon, and the and it's hot, and the door opens, and in walks the cowboy. That's in almost all those old west, and it's you know something's going to be setting up. We're coming here to to a conflict between the good guy and the bad guy, especially if they frame the shot so it goes and the doors open. See, it's a scene, and we just see it in the movies. We go, I know what's happening. And so, biblically, you get a similar thing with these recurring images, these recurring motifs, these recurring scenes. You see them and you go, bam, I got it. I know what's happening. Or I know where this is going. Or I know to pay attention to this. 
Um, one of the uh, things that was interesting there is the importance of Moses who meets his wife at a well. So Moses, who was thrown into the water at birth, who was pulled out of the water by his to-be-adopted mother, um, runs away, he meets his wife at a well. Um, all through his, he, he leads the people of Israel through the waters of the Red Sea. He strikes the rock, out comes water. And it's even the sin that he commits at the edge of the water that um, prevents him from going into the promised land. You can see how the, this water is this constant theme through the life of Moses. And so it ties the story together and it gives us insights, deeper insights. So um, going back to that, uh, you know, those ancient uh, assumptions in reading scripture. The, the one there that's the second one, but it's the first one I've got numbered, is that it is relevant to personal context. But it becomes far more relevant when we're able to bring to it the question of how do we understand this narrative? And we start to use our tools to unpack it. Oh, that was a lot. That was a lot. I kind of feel like I cracked through it very quickly. So I hope you uh, got it. If it was too fast, don't forget the notes are, of course, on the website. And you can access them uh, through the link that I posted on Facebook. Uh, and I will, uh, as always, put the video at some stage up on YouTube. I'm going to see if um, I've got a good day, Andrew, uh, from Simon and Jocelyn. And uh, I missed you guys too. And uh, yeah, I'll just see if there's any other questions that I can access. Oh, Greg says, good to have you back. It's good to be back. Uh, and a couple of others are watching. Lovely. If there are any questions, I'm not seeing any come up. Um, shoot me a message. I'll see if I can deal with them. Um, otherwise, now, pretty sure next week, nothing because of Parish Council. Good night. And God bless.